2001 Honda Civic with a 1.7 liter engine. We have a basically a no start condition. It starts, runs, and stalls. I'm gonna let you take a listen to it. So you heard in that start run stall issue that it almost sounds like it's starving for fuel, it's bogging out. And so what we're thinking about is which one are we missing? Are we missing spark? Are we missing fuel? Uh, first thing we can do is spray some carb clean into the intake while we try that event and see what it does. So we'll do that next. Okay, in this one I'm gonna spray some carb clean in the intake. I gotta be careful. Again, if this thing backfires on me, we can have a fire, so I gotta be careful. Open your throttle up a little bit and go ahead and start it. So you saw that did not make a bit of difference, so most likely it's not a fuel issue, but we'll still check fuel pressure and injection pulse anyway for the video. I don't think it's a fuel issue, so I'm gonna go after spark, and well, maybe we'll jump around a little bit. Do fuel first, do spark, I don't know. One of the two. Okay, in this segment, I'm gonna show you how to check for spark and see if we're losing spark. I'm just pull one of the coils out, and I'm uh, just using a test light connected to ground, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna watch this coil and uh, hopefully this shows up in the camera, this angle. Is that a pretty good angle on that? Can you see the inside of the boot? Yeah. And what I'm gonna try to do is show the spark while we're cranking it and it's running and see if we're losing it. Go ahead and, uh, go ahead and start it. Did that spark show up in the camera? Let's try it again just in case. Go ahead and start it. Okay, so I don't know if you heard it too, but we definitely did not lose spark. You saw the whole time that it was sparking all the way to the point where it stalled. So we're not really dealing with a spark issue here either. Fuel and spark look like they're okay. We need to think about what direction we're going next. I think I'll show fuel pressure and injection pulse anyway, just because. But if a vehicle doesn't start on starting fluid or carb clean, then chances are you don't have a fuel issue. But I'm going to show those steps anyway. All right, before I show the fuel pressure and injection pulse, do another quick test because it wouldn't run on carburetor cleaner and we have good spark is we maybe have a plugged exhaust and so what I've done is real easy to do on this one. I just pulled the upstream O2 out. We've given it a place for the exhaust to breathe. If this exhaust is plugged up to the level that it's causing a no start, we will be able to keep the car running with this O2 removed. So go ahead and try to start it. Try to keep it running. Okay, so no difference, same symptoms. Chances of this being a plugged exhaust are slim to none. Okay, I'm doing the fuel pressure check on this car and what I've done is I've teed in a fuel pressure line in the fuel rail and the key here is teeing in. We don't wanna do a static test. We wanna make sure that we're reading what the fuel rail pressure is. And so what I had to do is I had to actually remove the plastic line because I didn't have the right fittings for this. And I rigged in a rubber hose here. We'll get a shot of what the pressure gauge looks like with this thing crank. Okay, turn the key on first. I wanna check this thing for leaks, make sure we're good. Okay, we got good fuel pressure initially. No leaks anywhere, go ahead and crank it. All right, so you can see that it starts run and stall still with good fuel pressure. So fuel pressure is not our problem. Okay, show you a quick test we, what we can do to check for injection pulse, see if we're losing it. I'm just using a regular test light. My yellow and black wire is actually the feed for the injector. And then this opposite wire, I'm not sure the color of it, is the control. And actually doing that, you can actually hear me energizing the injector. So that's really not a good idea to do. Uh, what we want to do is with the engine running and we're looking for pulsing to take place on this circuit and uh, I'm going to watch for a control. In fact, as I realized that I just energized that injector, I'm going to do this a different way. What I'm going to do is unplug the injector 
and I'm gonna connect my test light to battery positive and we'll watch the pulsing that way. That way I'm not energizing the injector during this test. Okay, a little change up in direction. I, again, I took my test light to battery positive now and you can see when I touch ground, my light lights. Control wire for the fuel injector is the uh, opposite of this yellow and black. So I'm gonna back probe that and in this picture, what we should have now is a pulsing to take place while the car is running. Can you go ahead and start that for me? This is really substituting what a Noid light would do. Uh, we don't necessarily need a Noid light. We can use a test light to do it. Go ahead. And I'll get you focused in a little bit more on that light. It's a little bit dim because the injection pulse is small. Go ahead and start it again. And can you try to keep it running for a second? We'll watch this pulse. All right, that was a great shot. And what we saw in that shot was this vehicle dying out, but we were not losing injection pulse. So we have good injection pulse, we have good spark, we have good fuel pressure, looks like we don't have a plugged exhaust. Gotta think about where we're going next. Okay, next step I wanna show in this is just what the compression is on this engine. I know based on the symptoms that the symptoms don't match a compression problem, a vehicle that starts, runs, and stalls. But I'm just going to show it to you anyway because we have everything we need. We have spark, we have fuel, we have injection pulse. You know, the car is not acting normal, so let's address this next. And I don't think I'm going to show you all four. We've done this already. All four are the same. You can just take my word on it. We'll just do this first one. All four cylinders are going to show the same as this one. Go ahead and crank it. That's good. So you see our compression on that cylinder, we're about 150 pounds of compression, and that is the same number we saw across the board on this vehicle. We did not see a compression problem, at least static. So we need to go in another direction. Okay, quick review of where we are with this. We have good spark, we're not losing it. We have good injection pulse, we're not losing that. We have good fuel pressure, we have good compression. Our exhaust is not plugged. That's where we are with this vehicle. So our next step, that what we want to do is compare our ignition timing to cylinder firing events. The reason that we chose not to do relative compression and compare it to timing is the vehicle starts. And the vehicle starting will have a factor on starter current and that will mess up our waveform. And what I want to do is in cylinder pressure, compare that to cylinder timing. It's a little bit more accurate as I've shown in some other videos. So the tool I'm using is my Pico. I have the WPS 500 pressure transducer in cylinder one. And what I'm gonna do is read compression pressures with that. And then the blue trace you see to the left, I have connected to my coil control circuit on a coil over plug system where the transistor's inside of the coil. I wanna get you a quick shot of what that signal should look like first. Okay, just wanna be clear with this red trace here, this is really what we're gonna be looking at with my sync channel on the car, that blue channel that I've connected to the coil. This red trace here is gonna be a representation of what we're gonna see. It's gonna be a zero to four or zero to five volt square wave. Notice that this square wave occurs the same time the coil ramp occurs. So when we turn the transistor on, uh, and that's the perspective here, this is base circuit turn on, our current flow begins. And when we turn the transistor off, which is the end of the square wave, is where our current flow stops. So knowing ignition coil theory, when current flow stops in the primary is where spark is going to occur. And so what we know then, using this square wave as our sink, the trailing edge of this square wave pattern is where our spark is going to occur. And so what we're going to do is compare the trailing end or the trailing edge of the square wave to where cylinder top dead center compression is, and now we're gonna go back to the car, I'm gonna show you that. Okay, so as to not cause confusion, my second channel here I have is my blue lead. On the scope, the default for channel B where my blue lead's connected is red, so on the scope it's gonna be red. My blue channel is my cylinder compression, so I'm gonna have cylinder compression coming in here by the transducer, and I'm gonna have my voltage square wave pattern coming in here. Okay, scope set up on this. 
Channel A is my WPS 500, so I've selected the proper probe already. That's this one, I'm on range one, which is gonna be my cranking compression pressure range. And I'm gonna pick a 200 PSI scale. And channel B, I just have set up to a regular voltage scale, and I'm on plus or minus 10 volts. I know it's gonna be a five volt square wave. And as far as time base goes, remember we're looking at cylinder compression and we wanna see multiple patterns on the screen. So a 50 millisecond screen time is way too fast. I'm gonna slow this down a little bit. We're gonna go, I don't know, I'm gonna to go to a 500 millisecond per division. This is gonna be a five second screen. I think that's gonna be a pretty good starting point. I'm going to uh, turn the key on now, crank this up, let it start, and we'll see what this pattern looks like. Crank it again. Cool, one more time. Perfect. Okay, back to the stored waveform. Nice thing about the Pico is having this buffer. I have a couple ca uh, captures in here that we can look at. Starting on frame 13 here. Uh, we had a start, run, stall situation. And let's look at, I'm just kind of eyeballing these real quick. Yeah, I think we'll use this one. I think this one tells us what we need to know. Starting at the first crank or the first compression area, what we can see, the red trace, again, I told you guys, the red trace is my base circuit coil control signal that that red trace should be occurring. The tail end, the trailing edge of the square wave should be occurring very near top dead center. You can see we're a little bit after TDC on that one. And then you look at the next one, and what we see, you know, this is the car starting up. We can actually see the intake vacuum improving. You see that pocket in there, or that, that's actually the expansion pocket, sorry, not intake vacuum. Um, but these levels are changing as, as piston speed increases. So the car is starting here, and you see we're pretty much lined up to TDC on that one. And we're a little bit retarded on that one. Let me zoom in a little bit more. The next pulse, you can see that our timing is changing even more, that we're further from top dead center compression. And we could do calculations. I've shown how to do that in other videos. I don't think we need to do that though. Let's watch this. Watch the trailing edge of this red square wave compared to TDC. The car is still running here. And I believe at this point, the car is starting to stall. And notice what happened while the car is kind of conking back out. We have a, a firing event that's occurring there in relation to TDC, which is here. Again, I'm not going to do the math for this one. We could do that if you wanted to. That's three milliseconds before top dead center. And to figure out how many degrees per millisecond, then you would need to go your 720 total is 120 5.3 from compression to compression. Now our speed's kind of changing here a little bit too, so there might be some variables with that. But you can see timing's nowhere near TDC. And then look what happened on this next capture. Look where our timing is in relation to top dead center. It's nowhere near it. So the reason that this vehicle is stalling out is our timing signal or our timing is changing drastically in comparison to top dead center compression. No question about it. I mean, how cool is that capture right there? That we have a timing issue. The neat part about it though, is this timing issue that we have is not consistent. It's not always out of time. It's in time on initial crank, but goes out of time as we run the car longer and longer. So <clears throat> something is shifting, something is moving. We're not 100% sure on what yet. And what we're going to do next is we're going to uh, take the tire off, take the harmonic balancer bolt out and see if maybe we have a shifted keyway on the crankshaft. I'm not 100% sure on that yet. Uh, something is changing and moving back is what's happening. We definitely have a mechanical problem and in cylinder pressure transducer compared to ignition timing was absolutely key with this. And I have to tell you guys before we before we shot this yesterday, we did some, some of this work initially. It wasn't one that we did live on the way through. 
we were very excited to see this waveform because this thing was really, you would have never thought with the symptoms, I've, this is the first one for me that I've seen symptoms where I have a start run stall like that. It sounded exactly like we were out of fuel, didn't it? Yeah. We spray fuel in the intake, it didn't react to it. It sounded like maybe we were dropping out spark and we weren't using the conventional test light to ground test. The spark was consistent the whole time. The key with this was having the ability to look at in cylinder pressure and compare it to ignition timing and see this shift occur. I really don't know of another check that we could have done to identify this issue. Definitely a mechanical problem. We're gonna do some investigating next and see what we find. Before we pull everything apart and do some visual inspections on this Honda, I wanna throw in two more measurements here with this, and that is the cam and crank signals. Because if something's shifting, I should be able to see it in the cam and crank signals. So the next capture is gonna be, same thing, in cylinder pressure, in cylinder one, synchronized with the coil firing event, and then I'm gonna throw the cam and crank signals in here. You see my other two channels, the cam sensor signal is right here in the opening of this upper timing cover and the crank signal, kind of tough to see. I got a wire back there, it's down by the pulley. So cam and crank coming up next. All right, here's a still capture of the cam crank, cylinder pressure and coil firing event. I'm gonna zoom in on this, let you guys see it. What I, what I was trying to do is pick out a, an area of the cam and crank signal when it was running, when everything was lined up. And I'll try to do that for you. I'm, I'm gonna pick this, this little area on the cam sensor, this little small pulse. We'll kind of get an idea where that's occurring in relation to this TDC compression. And then also keep your eye on this double notch on the crank. So the top trace is the cam or TDC sensor. This one right here is the crank signal. And this is again when it was firing. So this would be when we're pretty much in time. And then we'll take a look at that same picture as we continue here. We start to see the timing shifting over a little bit more, but I don't see a shift in this cam pulse. It's still just after top dead center. I don't see a shift in the crank either. Check it here. Timing is moving over still, yet the cam signal is still in the same location. The crank signal is still in the same location. And we'll take a look at this one. This is just uh, noise in here. I had my sample rate turned up for this capture. Ignore the stuff in here. It's not a problem. Sample rate's just turned up real high. But take a look at it. Our timing's way off now. Here's your timing signal. This would be where the spark is occurring, which is somewhere just before the intake stroke. And we didn't get a shift in the cam, still lined up where it was, and in the crank. They look the same. So I said in the last segment, we have a mechanical problem, something is shifting. And I'm, I'm rethinking that now, I don't, I don't see anything shifting. So keyway problem on the crank, probably not. Something up in the cam area moving, probably not. Something's still wrong mechanically, I believe. Maybe our timing is just off, our belt is off. There is another clue here that I think we can use. And let me show it to you. Let me back up a little bit when this thing was running. And, and it's actually this area in here. So in my last video where I was doing some in-cylinder pressure transducer stuff, I had mentioned an overlay, placing an overlay, and then looking at where the intake or where the exhaust valve opens and then where the intake valve opens. And what we know from that is this area, let me put my cursor in here on the zero number first. Close to there. This area in here, from this point right here to this point right here would be our exhaust stroke. And there's something that's jumping out at me and that's the amount of pressure that is in this cylinder before the intake valve opens. So in this area, we would be into a vacuum. Numbers below this line are a vacuum. Numbers above this line are pressure. And we're talking 
a pressure of 14 pounds of pressure, roughly. 13 pounds of pressure that's occurring in that cylinder just before the intake valve opens. And I think that this suggests a valve timing issue. If it, if it was a plugged exhaust, which we've already confirmed it's not, I think we would see this be high all the way across during the whole exhaust stroke. We're not seeing that, it's at the tail end. It's almost like that exhaust valve is closing too soon. I'm not 100% sure on that, but I don't like that either. So next step I wanna do, I have actually another Honda in here that has the same engine and it's an 05. It should be the same setup. I'm gonna do a cam crank relationship on this known good 2005 I have. And the reason I wanna do that is I just wanna compare the cam and crank themselves to see where they line up. Let me get this other stuff out of the way so you guys can see it. Being I have a known good car here, why not use it? We may have a chain or a belt that's just off a tooth or two. And you know, that's our main issue. I'm not 100% sure yet, but take a look at this one real close. And I think what we can do is we'll look at a couple different areas, kind of look at the double pulse of the cam or the TDC sensor and look at the double pulse of the crank and kind of eyeball where those guys are lining up. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna go over to our other car, we're gonna retake a capture of the cam and crank on that car and then we'll have a known good vehicle to compare to and I'll store all this stuff in my database for future use. All right, this is our test subject here. This is a 2005 Honda Civic with a 1.7 liter engine, same engine, same setup. Something I didn't mention in the last segment when I'm getting this coil signal on this channel right here, which is blue here, but it's actually red on the scope. I am actually grounding the coil itself. You see a jumper wire? I am not leaving this coil open. We need to give this spark somewhere to go. Now we could do this unplugged. We could unplug the coil and get that same square wave, but what I found with it unplugged is it wasn't a clean square wave. It was kind of uh, a, a slow, gradual tail instead of a nice, clean square wave. So I left it plugged in for a clean signal so I can see where that timing is occurring. And so we're doing the same thing. I'm gonna do in cylinder pressure. Not that we need that, but being that it would be a real good comparison of a known good and a potential known bad. Now, this car runs, so what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna crank it, let it start, and then we'll shut it back off. And what that's gonna do is basically simulate what our other car is doing. It'll be a start, run, stall. Okay, another nice feature of the Pico is I'm actually looking at the stored waveform from our car with the problem. And all I need to do is set everything up the same way and just hit my start button, which I don't think you can see that here, this little green button at the bottom, or I can hit my space bar. And we're running again, we're gonna do the same exact capture. Go ahead and crank it, let it run, and shut it off. Shut it off, perfect. And what we're gonna do with this picture, this is our known good. Pause this for a second and we'll talk about it. Okay, this is the stored picture of our known good one. I'm in a much quieter environment. And uh, we'll zoom in on it first. Take a look at the, uh, the beginnings of this, where the vehicle started. And uh, this will be our first firing event of our ignition system. You see that's uh, actually a little bit after top dead center on that shot. Again though, it's the first one. And here's our, our second one. Tail end of the square wave is where the spark is occurring. Right away I see a difference. You see our, our uh, cam and crank are different. Take a look at this area right here, this small part of the cam or TDC sensor compared to the crank. In fact, let's get that measurement right there. They are lined up exactly with each other. The tail end 
trailing edge of that crank to this double pulse, or sorry, the trailing edge of this TDC signal right here to the double pulse of the crank, they are lined up exactly. Let's look through this a little further and we'll go back to our, our known good or our known bad, we're gonna call it now. You see our timing signal, trailing edge of this red square wave is the base circuit turn off signal. That's where our spark is occurring. So we do see timing changing a little bit, but you know the computer's in control of timing on this vehicle, so that's to be expected. Remember, we had the car, we cranked it, we let it run, then we shut it off. So we have some timing changes, nothing wrong with that. And let me zoom out a little bit. We'll kind of get closer to where we shut the car off. And remember, we didn't, this car didn't stall. We forced it to shut down. Just trying to simulate what was going on. We've got a pretty, pretty good advance going on right here. So I guess it's another variable when you're doing this. If you have a car running, you have to remember that ignition timing changes it would be the cranking test that would probably be the most consistent. Not probably, it would be. You're cranking an engine over, you're gonna have a consistent spark very, very near top dead center. Once a car is running, all of that, those bets are off. You see the timing has changed, but notice that we fired very near TDC the whole time, and I think the main point, or the main focus right now is gonna be this right here. This trailing edge of the TDC, TDC sensor or cam sensor to the double pulse of the crank right there. They are lined up exactly. All right, now let's go look at our picture now. This is our vehicle that has a problem. And we'll just look in that area. And notice where, let's go in just a little bit more. Notice where Our signal is, this is the TDC signal, the green, and where it should be lined up is over here at this point. So what this is telling us is our timing belt is off. It's not shifting on us, it's staying consistent the whole way through. If you look at this waveform all the way through, what I thought initially was a broken keyway or something shifting is not the case. This timing belt is just simply off, and my guess is it's either one or two teeth off. And so this is enough evidence now to pull the covers off. And, and really I think that's what, what we're doing here is showing methods, showing procedures, checking spark, checking fuel, checking compression, and having some testing equipment that gives us the ability to say, yes, indeed, our timing belt is off and we need to take the covers off. Now this one's pretty easy. You might be thinking, well, why don't you just start there? We could have done that, but remember there are vehicles that it is hours worth of labor just to do an inspection. And imagine being wrong on a vehicle like that. You pull all the covers off and everything's fine. Then what do you do? So that's the point here. The other thing too that we could look at, something I almost forgot to mention. Remember I said I didn't like, I did not like this big giant increase in exhaust or in cylinder pressure at the end of my exhaust stroke right here. And we had, let's take a measurement again. I'll get as close to zero as I can here. All right, that's roughly zero PSI right there. Everything above that cursor is pressure. Everything below that cursor is vacuum. And we have this rise in pressure uh, on that capture there. It's about 11 PSI rise. Now, some, th that capture did change a little bit. It wasn't consistent all the way through. Let me zoom out to show you a couple more of those. Let's get this cam out of the way. What we can see is that pressure rise and then as the vehicle is dying off, it drops and drops. 
And I think at that point the vehicle stalled right there. And let's check out our, our known good one. And let's look in that same area. We'll put a cursor in here on our zero line. And again, everything above that line is gonna be pressure and everything below that line is vacuum. And we'll just kinda of zoom in on that. This is our known good vehicle. And you see we are getting a rise there a little bit. That characteristic is there, but we're only at 2.6 PSI. It's a huge difference. And I think that is suggesting that it's a valve timing issue. That in itself, we could identify that as a valve timing issue that I think it would be our exhaust valve is closing too soon. And we could plug in an overlay in here and we could do cam profile and we could do where the valve timing is actually occurring. I'm not gonna do that for this waveform for this video but I do want to give credit where credit is due and that's where I get a lot of my information from. And there's actually three sites I wanna mention here. One would of course be Pico Auto. They have an automotive forum. So if you have a waveform say like we were looking at and you know, you're worried about that big pressure increase at the end and you can you know, post a picture of your waveform and a lot of guys on there will help you out for sure. So Pico Auto, their automotive forum uh, another one is the Auto Nerds. Some great guys on there too. Very, very knowledgeable with the Pico Scope. In fact, they sell the Pico Scope. And uh, when you buy from them, you can actually you get the benefit of being part of a exclusive group where you can't get there otherwise. Uh, so some great guys on here. Great information on here. I've used both of those sites. And then of course IETN. Uh, same thing. Put your waveform up there. You know, post something in the forum and, and tons of guys are willing to help you out. So I would say with these three, Auto Nerds, IETN, Pico Auto, and then Mitchell On Demand, you guys are looking at my information resources. This is what I use. Nice thing too about IETN is, is I've shown you guys this before, their knowledge base. Let's say that I didn't have a known good vehicle. I can go to the waveform library and what I can do is I can plug in the vehicle that I'm working on, let's say I want a waveform and I'm working on a 01 to 03 because our vehicle was a was a Honda. Actually, I can do I'll do a different range. You can pick different year ranges. We're working on a Honda and we're working on ECM inputs and outputs and then probably also the ignition system. And you can see that I have a 78 records to narrow that down a little bit more I can plug in my 1.7 liter engine and this is just wonderful I mean this is this is worth every penny you pay for it right here why did that go to a thousand what changed okay well I just increased my oh because I have all components here let's get rid of that We just want basically cam and crank. There we go, 23 records. And then what, what you can do is you can scroll through the results of this, try to find a waveform you're looking for. And there was a few in here. I'm not gonna go through, through these at this point, but I want you guys to know that there are some in here that you could have used had you not, see there's that one there had you not had a known good waveform, you could have done that. So just want to, again, give some credit where credit's due. IETN, Pico Auto, Auto Nerds, thank you guys for the great information. And uh, I think the next step that we're going to do with this process on this car, I think we have, again, enough information that we're going to go and uh, take the valve cover off, take the upper timing cover off, and we're going to take a look at these, uh, these lineups cam and crank 
on the belt itself and see what we got. And I think we're, again, we're basing that off of this TDC sensor or cam sensor in relation to what we had on our crank. And my two cursors, those should be lined up. So we could plug in math here, figure out RPM and figure out how many degrees we're off. There's lots of stuff we can do, but we have enough information here to take the covers off. Okay, we got the covers off our Honda. Just want to give you a quick shot of our marks and where we're supposed to be lined up. Our crank, you can see the white mark should be lined up with this pointer for top dead center. And then our, our cam, we don't have all the covers off, but we have this one off. Our cam, we have a mark at three o'clock and nine o'clock in plane with the top edge of the cylinder head with this up mark obviously around 12. So three o'clock or nine o'clock and three o'clock in plane with the cylinder head. Let's go look at what we got on the car. Okay, here's a shot of my crankshaft at top dead center, the single mark, the white mark at TDC. Get you a shot of the camshaft now. Okay, here's a shot of our cam. There's your mark that should be at three o'clock and there's your mark that should be at nine o'clock. Sorry. There's your mark that should be at nine o'clock. There's your mark that should be at three. Hard to see, but up here it says up. And it should be lined up with the plane of the cylinder head. And the plane of the head is about where my screwdriver is. So we are off one tooth. Picture this one down here. And this one up here would put me in line again with the plane of the cylinder head, we are definitely off one tooth. This camshaft, this engine turns counterclockwise, so my cam is one tooth advanced. Okay, here's a shot after resetting this belt. You see my marks that they're in plane with the cylinder head now at three and nine o'clock. Now they're not exactly lined up with the head, but in the same level, they are parallel to the cylinder head now. We're gonna see how this car runs with this cam proper, properly lined up. Okay, this is our after shot of resetting the belt. A Little bit of history, someone was in here, did a water pump. Looks like they may have done it wrong. We don't think the belt jumped. We reset the belt, everything looks good. I'm gonna start it up. That's a fix, one tooth off. First time I've ever seen a can be one tooth off with that kind of symptom. For sure, that's what it was. Our camshaft was one tooth advanced. So what we saw in that one capture with that high exhaust pressure or high cylinder pressure, this exhaust valve was closing too soon, causing that pressure rise. That is a fix, I like that. That was a good one.